Good. Okay. <clears throat> So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Audrey Chen. Well, it feels really weird to talk into the microphone, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, uh, I'm really happy that Nick invited me and also Henrik Beam Splitter um, to be a part of this uh, month, more than a month long, five weeks long exhibition project extravaganza, max, max to the to the max kind of uh, every day. I'm so impressed. Actually, this is. Um, I'm happy to be catching you, but I know that you're exhausted, so it's, uh, but it's great. Nick is our neighbor in Berlin, so we just actually became friends pretty recently through a common friend, Hugo Eskinka, who I work with, who was here as part of the, um, the project. How many weeks ago was that? Two weeks ago? Yeah. Two About weeks, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, yeah. Okay. I saw him right before he left. I didn't manage to catch him when he was back. He was also exhausted, so you guys working at really hard. Um, but we met actually just in maybe last year really briefly, but in January it kind of melded together this idea of, of having me take part because we met at the CTM opening, CTM festival in Berlin, and then we ended up started hanging out a bit more um, because he's our neighbor, like really literally two blocks away, which is fantastic. Um, and this come, the kids sort of came together because I told them that we had some dates in New York and we we're looking for some others and, the, and so here we are and so here I am. Uh, Henrik and I played last week on the 22nd. That was a really awesome evening um, and we're glad to be back here again before we leave uh, New York tomorrow to go to New Orleans. So I'm going to go visit my son, which is, yes, to be close. I do all this touring in the U.S. not really to make money. Um, it's really just as a kind of long kind of a helicopter style of parenting where I organize gigs. Henrik is Norwegian. He's able to apply for Norwegian funding to pay for our travels, and then I can see my son. So that's kind of the way that it's all sort of come together. It's a little bit more. It, it, I'm really happy to play these shows too, but yeah. But that's the, the, that's the second thing. That's always the second thing. So um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm from the US. I moved to Berlin in 2011. I know a bunch of people in New York somehow from some years ago because I started coming maybe in 2004 to play a lot. Uh, Issue Projects Room founder Suzanne Fiol was a really good friend of mine. Um, and that's kind of, I think, around that time when I first started coming. Uh, I was the first, no, maybe the second artist in residence at the silo space that she had on the Gowanus. Um, and Part of the whole story, I'm tying it together, is because she was a single mom and she really supported me. My son was born in 2000, and so around that time, he must have been five. And I didn't know if I would be able to make a living and figure out how to do this stuff that I do. I didn't know if it was possible, but she was a really huge supporter for me, and she would, we would stay with her, she would babysit Ivan, um, and I could do my residency. So it kind of all started around then to kind of sort of build what I am doing now. But it really, it was a, she was a really formative person for me to give me that sort of confidence to know that I could actually do something. Because at that time, there really were no models of single moms who were touring all over the place, doing really unlistable music, kind of unlistenable. Well, it's not totally unlistenable, but it's, it's you know, it's kind of um, not commercial at all. So. Um, so that's kind of how I want to start this thing because my entire practice is based on my life. And now that's uh, mm, almost 20 years later, close to 20 years later, um, and here we are. Uh, in 2011, I moved to Berlin. It was also kind of a survival move. Um, and I miss the States, but it's an easier place to live. So um, before I talk more, for those of you who don't know what I do, I work with my voice. I think in the last five years, I've worked primarily with my voice as a, as a tool, as a medium, as a, as a, a, a mode of, of using sound, but sort of mixing together or blurring the lines between language and sound work. 
it's, it's not one, nor is it the other, because the voice is really used to speak and it's used to communicate using words, uh, but it is also a, a completely vast uh, instrument, which is super dynamic, and you can start with nothing and you can keep going and keep going and keep going. So it's unlike, uh, say, a piano, which is very limited in some ways, a beautiful instrument, but you have a lot of limitations. You have keys, you have strings, it's percussive, it can resonate, you can prepare it in different ways, but the voice somehow doesn't, there's, you, you don't prepare it. I mean, you can prepare it with electronics and with um, external things, but the way that you can use the voice, I feel like it's sort of an endless palette of things that you can kind of continue to build on, using elements of language and using everything you hear and what you can use to filter through your body and use your voice to make whatever sounds that can come to you. Um, so I'm going to stop speaking in a language that you understand specifically and then just give you an example of what I'm doing with my voice. Um, we're playing a set later with Henrik and I and with Nick, so that's going to be a more full form version because I'm not going to blow out my gourd because I'm going to have to start speaking again and that's going to be really strange for me. So, and I also got a massage just now, so I'm a little bit spaced out. Um, this is kind of experimental. Let's try this. Actually, it's not that often that I use just my voice. Um, in some contexts, I do, but usually in a solo context, I have a, a synth that I use, not to process my voice, but I use it as sort of a tandem person, tandem instrumental thing, sound generating machine. Um, but now, just to simplify things, I'm just going to use my voice.
So that's the not language part. Um, it's kind of, but it's language, it's not language. Um, it's sounds, it's stuff that I'm imagining, I'm improvising, I'm using a lot of resonance and also kind of getting this physical feedback of the resonance in my face and there's a lot of techniques where I'm shooting the resonance into different parts of my um, resonating section of my head and it vibrates and when it's vibrating it makes me feel different things so the way that I'm improvising is not I'm not thinking or maybe of course it's still part of the thinking brain but it's it's somewhere in between the sort of physical um, invocation or triggering of what I'm doing that's making something happen and it continues. And it's a little bit like a story. It's a little bit like a narrative. It's kind of non-linear. It doesn't have this linguistic line to it, but it has its own 
sort of form to it. And it's, I think it's something that I'm constantly um, trying, not trying to figure out, but uh, thinking about and experiencing, but I don't have an obsession about defining it in a specific way for, for people to understand it better because what I'm doing is the expression in itself. Um, but I'm also thinking about how to explain it better to people, of course, because I'm talking right now. Um, so, um, oh, speaking words. Um, so when I started, let's let's rewind just to give you a little bio, biographical history of me and why I'm doing what I'm doing besides being a mom and my relationship to this space and being in New York and being situated here. Um, so. My parents immigrated to the U.S. in the mid-60s from Taiwan. My mother was born in mainland China, but when she was a child, her family was exiled uh, to Taiwan because her father was a general in Chiang Kai-shek's army. Um, so they just never could move back to China again. And they stayed in Taiwan, and my mother met my father in a college in, as an engineering um, majors. My mom was the first woman in her college to get an engineering degree, which I thought was normal when I was a kid, like, yeah, why, all moms are engineers. Um, but I realized as I got older that that's not the case. Um, but kind of cool that I felt that that was my normal growing up. Um, they moved to the States, they got their master's degrees and their doctorate degrees at University of Minnesota, which was a huge um, change from moving from Taiwan to a frozen tundra of where the car would get locked frozen and they would have to try to warm it up to get to school, you know, their classes and stuff. Uh, they have a lot of stories about that. Um, I was the born the third child uh, of uh, their, the family that they built uh, in the U.S., starting in Minnesota but then ending in Chicago. And I was born outside Chicago in 1976. Um, my parents worked, worked for Bell Laboratories, um, not in the cool sound section that everybody knows. Oh yeah, Bell Labs, so cool. My parents were helping to develop wireless technology. Um, my father was a metallurgist and my mother uh, was a failure analyst, which made me feel really weird growing up because as a daughter having a mother whose specialty was failure analysis, it's a little bit weird. Um, so I kind of always felt that, well, anyway, I have Asian parents. I don't know if you guys know about the trope of the Asian. Anyway, they're very critical, very judgmental, really strict, and really pushed me to get very good grades, which I rebelled against. And being the third child, actually, I had a little bit more latitude. My sister became a doctor, my brother became a software engineer, and I became this, doing weird sounds with my face for a living. Yes, I make a living! making weird sounds with my face, um, which is funny in a way. <laughs> um, now at the age of 84, my parents have come to accept me more, but it took a long time. <laughs> um, so re going towards the future a little bit. So I think I came into doing music. I started in classical music, and I, I think the way that I came into it was because I needed some place that was my own. We moved. We, my, we moved to uh, northern uh, Massachusetts where my parents transferred jobs and we were living over the border in New Hampshire in a very rural town and I, I think there was not even an olive skinned person in the school. There was me, my brother, and then completely white, completely white and like nobody had ever seen anybody that looked like me ever before. And I thought that was completely bizarre, but it was kind of a hard childhood. So I think when I turned to music, it was a way that I could hide away and make an excuse for not having to be social with people because it was really tough. Um, so that's probably the reason that I got into doing music in the first place, practicing a lot. My excuse to hide away from people was to be in the practice room and just shed. Um, so that, I started that when I was really little. And um, continuing forward, fast forward, fast forward, um, I ended up getting a degree in classical music, in voice. 
I lived in New York, 94 to 97, got kicked out of school. I'm not going to tell you why. Then moved to Baltimore, eventually got my degree somehow, but I don't function well in institutions. Immediately during my last year, I got pregnant. So age 23, I got pregnant, and I didn't know how to continue doing classical music. I didn't, I wasn't in, my heart wasn't into it anyway. I didn't like the business. It was not where I'm, I envisioned expressing myself in a full way because really, actually, as a classical musician, mostly you're just an interpreter. Um, and I had something more to tell. I had, there was a bit more of a story to tell. So I met some people in Baltimore. There was a scene there. And uh, they sort of introduced this idea of non-idiomatic improvisation, using instruments or non-instruments or objects, just working with sound. And it was kind of opened my brain and it was the perfect time to do that because I was a, a mom and I didn't, a young, very young mom, I was a kid. Uh, I didn't think I was a kid then, but really at the age of 23, we're kids. Um, and that's kind of how it all started. Sort of that moment, that really very transgressive moment of like having a kid really young and not knowing what to do, not having a job sort of gave birth to everything else that happened afterwards, um, which was great, actually. It was hard, though, because I was a single mom. And then fast forward to being the story of New York, and then Suzanne giving me support, and then me just continuing on that path and working really hard to try to figure out how to make a living doing what I do. Moved to Berlin 2011, had met a lot of European musicians who were making a living doing what they were doing. And I was living in the States, working five part-time jobs and trying to tour every other month um, and having my kid with me and all these tours, which was really fun, but also really hard. Um, and now we're here today. Um, my son has graduated from UCLA last year. He's now become a rocket engineer, weirdly enough. There was this uh, 3D printed rocket that launched on Wednesday. He works for that company. Um, it, did, it did go up in the air. It didn't explode on the stand, so that was a big success. So the company still exists, and my son still has a job. Just so. so tomorrow, I, we fly to New Orleans. Uh, we have a couple more gigs, and I'm mostly seeing my son, because that's where he's living. And he's working at the Stennis Space Center, which is an hour commute from New Orleans. Um, yeah, so here we are. That's like a really, like trying to condense everything together. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. I'm sure I do. You know, I, I, I kind of think about every sound that I hear as source material. And then the moment I hear a lot of things, I do try to mimic sounds or I try to, something in my body, like it's, a, it's like I, I sometimes talk, think about my body like a recording device, like a historical recording device. So my, my parents, of course, made all these decisions to come to this, the country. They gave me a lot of like, they passed on a lot of their anxiety to me and I had to deal with it as an adult, young adult child, a young adult something, more adult, middle-aged person now, uh, I guess, um, growing up. So it's all a part of me. So everything that I hear and every sort of physical part of my experience, my lived life, including my sonic um, experience is part of me and my body. So my body starts to digest all of this material and then it comes out. So I'm, I'm sure because I can speak a little bit of Mandarin and I hear it in my family's language, but I'm also living in Europe where I speak mostly English and a little bit of German, but I hear languages all the time, but it's just sound material to me. It's interesting. I can kind of turn off my, my, comprehens my comprehension, even if I do understand it sometimes. If I don't understand it well enough, I can kind of turn it off and then turn it into sound. And so it's all sound. 
So I hear all these languages being pronounced, you know, Brazilian, Portuguese, Portuguese, Spanish. I, there's a lot of Indonesians in Berlin right now. I hear, you know, different languages all over the place. And I'm, whenever I hear something, I'm kind of like, oh, I wonder how that sounds kind of very, I don't know, not in a very conscious way all the time, but it's kind of subjective. So yeah, I'm sure there's language in there, but I don't, I don't think about it in a super conscious way all the time. Sometimes I do, but you know, things happen in the moment of uh, improvisation. So, yeah. Yeah, you might have. Yeah, you might have. It's true. It's true. Anybody else? Who are you pointing to, Nick? I thought it was Spencer. This is a talk, but it's also a Q&A, so I really am depending on you guys to help me um, to, to generate more source material or ask me something that I might not think about saying, so. Yes. Um, I would say it's like being an athlete. So if you do like an extreme sport or something like this, you kind of get energy, but you expend energy. Because when I'm using, because my body is so interconnected with the practice that I'm sometimes, um, and you'll see more, but he, I use all my inhale and my exhale, so it sort of drives me to the point of being a little bit on the border of uh, hyperventilation. So that also kind of boosts this sort of um, physical thing that taxes me, but also gets me a bit hyper at the same time. So it is, um, it's, yeah, it's totally exhausting, but it also gives me a lot of energy in a way that other, experience, other things don't. I think there's endorphins and other things that are being triggered, so, yeah, yeah. Yes, Spencer. Mm. Yeah, um, well, I used to, when I was doing classical music, practicing like scales and, you know, widening the range, but it was in one kind of technique. I think that I don't, I, I, every now and then I do like weird, like little warm-ups that are kind of classical, just to work on the volume and, and like understanding the resonance in my body again and things like this, but I don't do it super regularly. I don't really ad adhere to this like kind of shedding practice regimen that I used to when I was younger. I felt like I spent enough time isolated in a practice room that I don't need to do that anymore. I didn't have any friends either and so that is way more fun now, you know, a more social human. And um, But what I do is I try to take care of my body. So. I do yoga, I try to get out and move around so the circulation is moving. I try to do a lot of deep breathing. Uh, I just try to keep healthy. And the R&D thing is like, yeah, sometimes just not using my voice. Like, I'm really happy after tonight, I'm super excited to play, but I don't have another gig until April 1st, so I can kind of keep it down a little bit. Because it is, like, I'm using my voice in a kind of extreme way. When I do it every day, I mean, I have done it every day for like 20 days, which is kind of crazy. And I feel completely wasted. But somehow that endorphin thing, it kicks something out of my body so I'm able to kind of trigger it and then do it again when it comes to like 24 hours later. But sometimes I really do need that 24 hours to recover from the day before. It's, some, it's a weird thing if I did it, like if it would be much harder for me to do like an evening show and then do an afternoon show. So I kind of need that whole day, I need the sleep and I need the whole day. Sometimes I don't even get the sleep, so it depends on the tour. So it's a, it's a kind of a, I think it's a constant balancing act of figuring out how to rest and where to put out the majority of my energy. I don't know, I mean, my, in my daily life, I'm not like a really super loud, hyperactive person. I think I'm, I kind of keep it kind of cool. So I have a little bit left over to, to, to give at the end of the day. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Kind of? Yeah. yeah, I guess, like, yeah. Um, the, the, the part of our idea, I think about it, is sort of resourcing the 
Uh, research. Oh, yeah. I'm not like a super researchy person, which is kind of... I guess I just mean like finding Yeah, yeah. No, it's like I walk around, I'm in the shower, kind of. It's a little bit like I know things are going to come to me, and at this point especially, I think, you know, being 46, going on 47, which is still young. Um, but I feel like... everything's just going to happen. I mean, I don't want to say that I'm like a really passive person because I'm really not, but, um, but I have a lot of trust in the fact that my body is going to generate different material. Also because every day that I'm getting older, I get different material. I lose material, I gain material, the body's changing all the time. And what do they say? Like every seven years, there's like a weird, gener like weird switch around in your body and then you're like a to totally, totally different human in the physical way. I don't know. But I really have, I'm a kind of, uh, in, in terms of sound material, it's really transformed over the years. I think it's because of age, I think it's because of experience. Also, because I started the whole career with my cello, it was different. I needed to negotiate things differently because I had an instrument I had that I was playing and then I had the voice and I also had the electronics and a lot of that work was about transition. I think, and now removing all of that, I'm so fo so hyper focused in this one thing that it really has pushed um, and really deepened the practice. But it, I did it actually because m removing the cello from the practice really just started with a back injury, and I couldn't carry the instrument anymore. And as I kind of started to rehabilitate, and I still have a back issue, I know that I can't continue to tour, like do 20 dates in a row and have a cello and carry it around and lug it around and all these train stations without elevators and stuff like this. I can't do it anymore. But that changes things. So I'm also fascinated by how life happens and it changes things inevitably. And I kind of trust in that sort of way that things can just happen and things will just transform anyway. Like being a mom, I think really taught me how to improvise. Um, I don't think listening to improvisers taught me at all how to improvise. It was really like, it was really like, uh, what do you do when your kid knocks over a whole thing of like soup in the grocery store? Like that thinking, that like quick thinking, sort of um, whatever it is, is what taught me the most about kind of negotiating inside of sound, actually. I kind of try to apply this, uh, what do you do? Uh, oh, I have to do, okay. And you have to be convincing. You have to see, you, you, you can't lose your shit. You can't lose your cool. You have to at least pretend like you know what you're doing so your kid doesn't get really insecure. And it's the same thing. It's a little bit the same thing, I think. So. Yeah, I learned how to improvise, not from like, I need to learn how to improvise, and I'm gonna do step one, and step two, and step three. This is what I need to do. It's more like, life is happening, and, and, the, and, and the more I can learn how to negotiate it, be a good mom, whatever way that is, there's not one way to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated about how I didn't manage to fuck up my kid. Um, I think that's the biggest success thing that I ever has, I've ever done. Whatever I'm doing with my face and all this stuff, this is just an expression of that. But the biggest success thing I have in my life, I guess it's not a success, I didn't make him, but I mean, I raised him to be a kind of okay, great, sort of amazing human being and who's happy and who's well-adjusted and who's doing rocket stuff. So that's kind of cool. My parents are really proud of him and me a little bit by like I shine in the light of my son. Um, but yeah, so that, yeah, that's sort of the answer, the answer. Yes. So the time before last, the last time I saw you play was just a few days ago. Oh, here. yes.
You mean like the, like the different kinds of spaces? Yeah, or? Just, just sort of how that's uh, impacted your practice at large. Oh, yeah. Or if there is a difference or not a difference at all. There is a difference. I mean, I actually have to say that I have more fun playing in kind of more DIY spaces. It's sort of where I come from. I used to live in a warehouse in Baltimore. My son would ride his bicycle to the bathroom. Spencer and I met at this warehouse. That's true, Ivan was little. We lived in a room that was quite far from the bathroom, so he had to ride his bike there. We didn't have to, but you know, he had little legs and stuff. And he was afraid of the shower, so I had to get a keg tub and fill it up with water, and then he could take a bath, and then he would air dry. It was a little bit like this, because you couldn't control the heat, so the only way you could cool it down in the winter was to open all the windows. And then he would air dry naked, riding his bike around with his little slippers. Everybody loved it, it was really cute, it was really cute. But I love that. So, I mean, I'm more used to that than a fancy concert space or Berghain, which is, fan it's not really fancy, but there is a high production value, I guess. But um, I love all of it, though. I mean, I, okay, yes, I prefer DIY, but I get paid more and the other one is important so I can support myself and support, I mean, it's not that, w I make very much money, but moving to Berlin, you have a good quality of life for not having to pay that much. And that's really important to me that I don't have to like stress and push and push and push until probably I actually break my back. So, but, and now my son's grown up, so I have less stress and, but um, yeah, I, I love all the spaces in a way because it makes me have to be flexible, and that's really important, because that's part of the practice, staying flexible, rolling with it. If there's a space that doesn't have heat, well, that kind of sucks, but then I borrowed a sweater from Leah, and she gave me a hot water bottle, and, you know, saved up my energy, and then put it out, but it doesn't make me feel really negative about it, it's just another situation to kind of get through or, but it wasn't even just getting through it because the gig was great, the music was great, the people were great, it just was cold. Um, and actually the sound here is a lot better than the Function One speakers at Berkeley. <laughs> at, at least. I agree. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, they're great speakers, but the guys there didn't really know how to do live sound with like an acoustic microphone situation. They're much better about plugging things direct and then making the speakers work for themselves. So um, I love it all. It's all part of it. But I could never, I, I think I could never give up doing stuff that's more DIY or more scrappy. I would miss it too much. I love playing in the backs of pubs and meeting weird people at gigs. It's really important to me. I don't want to always do like a big festival where there's all this like commercial stuff that surrounds it and then I'm separated from the audience. I don't, I like to meet the people that I have an effect on, whether they hate it or they love it because they can really hate it because it's, yeah. Um, but it's important to me to kind of maintain that close relationship because I think what I do is really intimate and that intimacy I feel like sometimes really requires a kind of close space which you can't always get from Places like that. Yeah. Students or apprentices? No apprentices. I mean, my son used to help me carry some stuff when we were on tour, but not too much because he was small. Um, he was never an apprentice. He was going to always be an engineer. He was doing his homework on tour. Yeah. Um, I've given lessons. I think people. I used to teach voice lessons a um, long time ago, like a kind of regular thing when I was trying to make more money when I moved to Berlin and I had like 11 students at one time. It was mostly teaching adults and then sort of teaching them about using their voice. It wasn't like a classical thing. I wasn't teaching them music. I was just teaching them about how to produce sound with their, with their apparatuses. A lot of them came to me with some trauma and when they're a little, a lot of people have this, you know, like some music teacher said, oh, you sound terrible, and then they'll never sing again. And then when they do, they get stuck, and she says, I like this. They don't know how to project because they don't feel confident enough to do that. And it's a lot about confidence. So um, now I don't have as much time because I'm touring a lot. Um, 
but every now and then I have uh, people that come in that want to take some, like maybe five lessons. Or, I mean, in Europe, it's a kind of different, um, different kind of thing. There's like schools that teach improvisation and things like this, and these schools have quite a bit of money, especially if they're in the Nordic countries. Some of them will give the students money to travel to some place and study with somebody, and then they pay me like a hundred bucks an hour for you know five lessons, and then I teach them whatever it is. They, they mostly want to have, it's a little bit like this, but on a very small scale, but with like a little bit more breathing exercises, um, with some more vocalization, getting them to make sound, just, you know, it's, it's not really, I don't know, I, it, I find it kind of tricky sometimes because I know that there are other people kind of giving voice lessons and it's a little bit more hippy trippy, a little bit more like, oh, you s explore like, your feelings with your voice. It's a little bit like that, but it's not quite like that. So it's, it is kind of getting in touch with something inside yourself, trying to understand better what's happening and having the confidence to it is very th it is very therapeutic actually I feel I always feel kind of um, cleaned out let's just say after a gig it's great I mean it's great for me I don't it's, yeah so yeah anybody else no more questions okay oh okay last one yeah. Hmm. Oh, um, con no, confidence, for sure, confidence is more important, but you, I think uh, it needs to be measured. I mean, I think that it's, for me, I'm, I, I'm really glad that I have the tools that I have because it makes me access things a bit further. I think if I didn't have the sort of mus muscle memory and understanding of my, uh, the inside of my, my um, apparatus, I wouldn't be able to, to project as loud as I do. I wouldn't be able to control from la loud to so uh, soft. I mean, it, it just in the instrument, but also in my hearing, I think I have an understanding of where I wouldn't, if, otherwise I think if, if I didn't, I didn't, hadn't had a close relationship with these instruments, like with timbre, with dynamics, with um, rhythm, I mean, you, you can get all of this from just listening to stuff, too, but for me to be able to make them produce some techniques, I think it has helped a lot. I don't think it's 100% necessary, but there needs to be a kind of practice behind to support some of the sounds that I'm doing, I, I think, it, it, without to, to also not hurt yourself, because I think it's really easy to hurt your voice and, and I think a lot of people will think that I'm hurting my voice if I'm going, ah! you know, like this. <clears throat> yeah, and and it, I, I, I am, but only to a certain extent. And I know when to back off. So that's why I'm changing materials all the time. I can't do that sound for one hour because I would totally thrash myself and I would never be able to speak again. But I could, I can make that sound for one breath and then in between that make a different sound, which will rest and then I can come back. So it's a little bit... Also, the knowledge of like that's what my body will do. It's like being an athlete. It's uh, it's like training for a marathon. Okay, no, whatever. Okay, okay, okay now you're four day. <laughs> but conceptually, that's it's a little bit like that. Like you don't want to go for like a super crazy race without having never done any kind of running before in the first place. Con that's the idea. That's the idea. So, okay, that's it. Thanks. Now we're going to have some music. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, guys. <clears throat>